Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, welcome to Onog the Barbarian's Homebrew Power Hour, cruising for a bruising, where we attempt to brew the unbrewable, craft the uncraftable, and all together make races, classes, magical items, anything that we feel like we need to add to the wonderful pantheon that is D&D. And today I was thinking we could take a look at the Gorgon. So, the first steps you want to do for doing a homebrew is you've got to examine the history of the kind of thing you want to do. What does it mean to be, in this case, a gorgon, or previously a dryad, or a titan-blooded barbarian, things like that. You have to examine mythologically what the history of that thing is, because then you have a good jumping-off point of what you want to try and make. The books themselves, the, the player's handbook or monster manuals, are a good starting point but they don't always have the full breadth and history of things. So the easiest way to make a homebrew, as we've discussed on the podcast multiple times, is to take something that already exists and either modify it or use precedents and examples that have been given in other races and classes and things like that and see what you can do with things that haven't been modified to be used by players. So for instance, um, if you... Uh, the Kanku are a very good example. If you take a look at their stat blocks and their histories and things like that and their abilities, and you kind of break it down piece by piece, you kind of get what eventually gets made in the uh, Volo's Guide to Monsters as a player race. So in this case, we're going to be taking that and doing that to the Medusa, or as I like to call it, the Gorgon race, because Medusa is a specific person, and Gorgons are the kind of creature that she is. So we are taking a stat block. Actually, there are two different uh, Medusa quote-unquote stat blocks. We are taking a stat block from the Monster Manual and from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, which both have examples of Medusa-type creatures that we can take a look at and see what we want to keep, what stays true between the two of them, and what can be disregarded. So first, what we want to look at in this Medusa slash Gorgon race is look at the mythological history like I was talking about. Uh, Medusa specifically uh, is a mythological creature. Uh, she shows up really only a couple times in history. One is in her own origin story, and two is in the story that was adapted into the classic film Clash of the Titans, where she she's actually the MacGuffin of the narrative where Perseus has to kill her and take her head to go kill an even bigger monster. It's kind of his thing. This, this particular story was immortalized in the 1981 classic Clash of the Titans, and then since drug through the mud in the 2010 absolutely not a classic Clash of the Titans, by the same name. So, originally how Medusa came to be a weird lady with snake hair that turns people into stone when she looks at them, is she was originally cursed by the gods themselves. Particularly, she was cursed by Athena, the circumstances of which get a little problematic when you look at it from a modern point of view. She was, let's say, for the children in the audience, she was receiving unwanted advances from Poseidon himself. Poseidon didn't take no for an answer, and so Athena gets mad about this because it was taking place in her temple, and so thus cursed poor Medusa that anyone who gazed upon her face would immediately be turned to stone. Now, that being said, what Medusa becomes, various different narratives say it is either a cursed position or a position of power uh, from different lenses that have been looked at. In the story of Perseus, when he is clashing with Titans, it is often kind of phrased in such a way that Medusa totally deserved everything she got and she needs to have her head cut off. But in a more modern telling and a more modern lens looking at the story, you can very much tell that this is a woman who has been put upon and then cursed for her own victimization. And in, ironically enough, by Athena, literally the goddess of wisdom and feminine power kind of a thing. So there are some who look at that and say, no, this isn't a curse. This was a gift given to her to protect her from all the unwanted advancements of men, which I, I think is a kind of a neat interpretation of it. But interpretations aside, at one point, Medusa is cursed to the point that she can no longer be gazed at with the naked eye. The only way to look at Medusa is through mirrors and things like that. Because if, you, like I said before, to gaze upon her face would be to turn to stone immediately. Also, for some reason, she also gets snake hair. 
So, so one of the one of the primary things that you get from that is that no matter how you shape it, whether Medusa is a wretched monster who deserves the punishment she gets, or an ostracized person being given the the cursed protection of a god, they are Medusa herself and Gorgons in general live on the fringe of society. They are not necessarily welcome either through their cursing or through their mistrust of who they might be or why they were cursed in the first place kind of a thing. So, and you can take it a couple different ways. Magic the Gathering takes it a specific way that Gorgons aren't necessarily a curse, but they are a race of creatures. Whereas D&D takes it from a different angle where it is a specific curse placed on specific people for doing specific things. In this case, vanity is, is the source of the Curse of Medusa, which brings us to their stat blocks. So one of the things that is... Obviously, the most important is the ability Petrifying Gaze. Now, that being said, the ability to instantaneously kill a creature that fails a save is a little bit powerful to put on a player character. So we'll come back to that. First, we will look at the stat block that is presented to us in the Monster Manual. So we've got middling strength, a decent dexterity, a very, very high con, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma are next. So constitution seems to be the highest stat for the Medusa. So I would say giving a Medusa plus two to constitution is a good place to start, and it can help create for a unique stat block that not every other kind of creature has. There are only a few creatures that do get plus two constitution. I believe they're dwarves, and I think certain halflings? Or no, they only get plus one. Yeah, so there's only only dwarves get plus two constitution. So depending on where we go with the next stat, or or if it's variable or things like that, could make for a very unique stat block that not a lot of people have. So her next highest stat is dexterity and charisma, both at a 15. The the interesting thing about using the stat blocks to kind of build the the racial bonuses a character would get if they chose this race, uh, it's kind of like a little bit of a hint given to us by the creators of D&D. They look at these things and they say, what is the most important thing for a Gorgon to have? What is the most important thing for a dragon to have? And that can give you as a home brewer a clue as to what stats should be given to the player for that. So dexterity and charisma are the next highest. I would say Gorgons aren't often inherently viewed as dexterous, though there are certain versions where they are more snake, more naga-like, where they are full-bodied snake, and that can be an interesting build where they are more physical as opposed to this terrifying presence with their magical abilities kind of thing, and that could be an interesting way to take it. But personally, the way I'm going to interpret the Medusa stat block is that the next highest stat would be charisma, and this is usually a pretty good balance, having a physical trait bonus and a mental trait bonus. So say giving a a Medusa plus two constitution, plus one charisma, I think that could make for some very, very interesting, potent things. That means Medusas would make great sorcerers with inherent magic granted to them, or great warlocks granted power from deities or elder beings and things like that. And that kind of mixes well with the idea of a curse being granted upon them and them meddling with powers beyond their control. Additionally, it would make a very interesting paladin, actually. So, then let's go down to the actions. Uh, They get multi-attack, things like that. They get swords, longbows. That's just the equipment they happen to have. That doesn't really matter. The most interesting attack action they get is snake hair, which in this case comes to a 1d4 plus 2 because that's they're using their dexterity, interestingly enough, to deal the damage. And then they get poison damage on top of that. Now, the stat block that we have here is probably a little much to have an inherent melee attack used by the player. Uh, 1d4 plus 2 plus 4d6 poison is probably a little much, especially when it's guaranteed. I think the highest innate, like, natural weapon we get are through Tabaxi and Aarakocra, which is just 1d4 plus your strength. So the fact that this seems to be using dexterity for their snake hair attack and then also gives an additional 4d6 poison damage, that seems a little much. But then also, you do want to make it feel special. It's very interesting to note that the Magic the Gathering version of Gorgons do not have snakes for hair, they just have tendril-like hair coming off of them that looks like the, the ends of snakes, but they do not 
have the all the tiny pointy mouths that would be coming out. So if you were trying to make a Ravnican Gorgon, this wouldn't be something that you would include because that poison attack is not present. So I would say 1d4 plus strength, piercing damage for like the snakes biting down, and then maybe if you wanted to add the extra poison damage, make it be a con save based off of your constitution and your proficiency. So for instance, if you had a 16 constitution and you were level 5, it would be a 14 DC saving throw to resist the poison. And uh, as you know, if you've studied anything about the poison res or damage resistances in 5th edition, you know poison is actually the highest resisted and immune damage type to any creature in, in, the, dungeon er, in the monster manual. So... Adding poison damage to things, actually, if you look at it in the broad terms, isn't that much of a bonus. But when it does count, it does. And when it doesn't, it really didn't matter in the first place. So given that little snake hair bite, if your Medusas want to start headbutting people <laughs> with their with their curly with their with their curly slimy locks. So, we've got those abilities. Now, it is interesting to note that the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica in their Undercity Medusa stat block include innate spellcasting in them. Specifically, once a day the Medusa gets to cast Expeditious Retreat, Fog Cloud, and Misty Step. Now, this is very, very specific, kind of leading to the the Undercity kind of vibe that they are trying to give these Medusas for the um, they they live in the sewers basically, and they skulk away if not Im immediately able to surprise their foes and turn them to stone and turn them into their lovely little um, statue gardens, sort of so to speak. They also get magic resistance, and if anyone's listened to the podcast, you know my feelings on giving player characters magic resistance. Don't do it. So I'm looking at you, you wanty. So. We have these different abilities that just kind of feel like maybe they were part of a class that this Medusa was supposed to be in, and not necessarily inherent in what a Medusa actually is. Same thing with the other ability, they get Surprise Attack, which is very reminiscent of the Assassin's Assassinate ability, where they get to do extra damage and they, they have advantage on surprised creatures. These are things that just kind of feed into the, the, the environment of the Medusa, not necessarily what the Medusa actually is. So these are things that you could take into account, but if you're homebrewing, probably not going to include in the player race itself. And so now we get to petrifying gaze. Now we talked about how giving someone the, the I think it's a sixth level spell, flesh to stone, giving them that spell at any level inherent in their race is probably a very bad idea. Now we have the precedent of player inherent spell casting from their race gaining in power over over a period of time like at, at at level one they only have a cantrip at level two they get a first first level spell at level three they get second level spells things like that so we could look at this maybe there's a way we could play it where the player gets hold person and they can use it once per short rest and that's the only thing they get now once per short rest for hold person that's pretty powerful in my opinion. So maybe we make it once per long rest and then boom, there you have it. You got a snake attack and once per once per long rest, the Gorgon can make a petrifying gaze that paralyzes someone but doesn't quite turn them to stone. Now that being said, does that feel like a Medusa? Is that why you're playing the Medusa? Would would that would that satiate you as a player if if you were to go, "Oh, I want to be a Medusa and turn people in the stone." Well, the only thing you can get is paralyzation now and again. And it depends on who you're dealing with. If you're the DM and you're dealing with a player who just really, really wants that outcast, like extra, extra hardcore outcast feel, that might be an, that might be enough. But at the same time, it feels almost cheap to weaken them that much. Now, there we have another precedent in the creation of racial feats specific to individual races. And in these racial feats, especially with drow magic and wood elf magic, we have examples of expanded spells or increasing the potency of spells and things like that. So it could be that you add a racial feat that say, because it's a six level spell, it has a level requirement as well as a race requirement. So we could have it be at level 11. And if you are a Gorgon race, you can take this feat and it adds one to constitution or adds one to charisma or things like that. Or you have the option and you get to cast the spell flesh to stone or have the Gorgon petrifying gaze ability that you can use once per long rest or short rest. 
But then at the same time, that would be really cool and very powerful. And you could use that. I would say, honestly, Constitution kind of speaks speaks to me as using that as the casting ability for the spell. Nothing else really uses Constitution. And it, it kind of, instead of being an inherent magical ability granted by charisma, like barding or sorcery or or warlocks but it kind of feels like it's more of an intrinsic physical thing coming from the gorgon but like i said before that being said does waiting to level 11 to get the primary ability of the race you want to be does that feel good i don't know not necessarily but maybe if someone's patient and willing to work up to that then that's something that they can they can gain like they can move towards. I actually did a sort of a halfway point for each of these with the campaign that Bean was actually DMing. We kind of went halfway that the person was slowly turning into a gorgon and that's why their abilities weren't as potent as they could have been. But then as her character delved more and more into vanity and and um things like that her powers grew, but also the curse grew upon her. Now, that being said, we could take this into a radically different direction. And this would, of course, need to be approved by your DM or honestly anyone involved at the table. But what if it wasn't a power that the, that the Gorgon got? What if, just like in the tales of Medusa of old, what if it was a curse? What if it wasn't something you got to control? What if, very similar to a Dark Elves sunlight sensitivity, it was something that you had to maintain and protect yourself and other people from? What if it's not the spell flesh to stone? What if petrifying gaze is just something that happens when you look at the player character who's a Medusa? Then suddenly this the whole role playing aspect of being an outcast, being a Medusa, being a Gorgon truly comes into play. Now, that being said as well, that is a very abusable ability. That is a very potent ability. But it also could lead to a TPK if the Medusa is walking around without her sunglasses on and suddenly everyone in the party is turned to stone and she has to figure out a way to reverse it. So it kind of comes down to your, your play group. We could have this super powerful ability that probably shouldn't be the way we go. So I would say there are two different kinds of Medusas you can make. There's this innate spell casting where they get hold person and eventually maybe even hold monster and then they can take a racial feat later on that gives them the full potency of a gorgon or we could go the other way the medusa's curse way where it is an innate ability in the gorgon that if anyone looks at them they go under the under the effects of the spell flesh to stone or the gorgon's petrifying gaze ability and that is onog's cruising for a bruising this week i think we did some work and i don't know Maybe this is unbrewable, maybe this is too much, but I think we did a good job. So think about these kinds of things in your own homebrew. What is too powerful for your group? What are you willing to try and work around? A lot of people think Aarakrokra, because of their innate flying ability, are too powerful. So if you're in one of those kind of situations, maybe the all the petrifying gaze all the time version of the Gorgon, it's probably not for you. And you'll probably want to steer clear, or steer clear of that and aim more towards the 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 more level-headed Gorgon with innate spellcasting abilities instead. But I think both of these are great options that you could try and use, and maybe you could even perfect upon. So I look forward to seeing all your guys' homebrew on the normal podcast, and we're going to post in the uh, links in the description to PDFs of our own versions of the Gorgons. So go ahead and comment below what you like about the Gorgon race. Did you think I went too far? Did you think I didn't go far enough? What would you do in my stead? And also, don't forget to email us at thecopperfoxin at gmail.com. And once again, I look forward to homebrewing with you guys. <laughs>